I'm often accused of being Islamophobic, as are many who call attention to the reality of jihad terror. In George Orwell's Nightmare of a Totalitarian Future, the novel 1984, a secret police monitors citizens for so-called thought crimes against the totalitarian state. A thought crime is an idea or an attitude the totalitarian rulers deem to be politically incorrect. Islamophobia, which is generally understood to be an irrational or pathological hatred of Muslims or Islam, is the name that has been given to a modern-day thought crime, and a global movement is promoting its incorporation into law today. In the term Islamophobia, the purpose of the suffix is to suggest that any fear or phobia associated with Islam, for example, the calls of its prophet or its current-day imams to kill infidels, or the attacks of 9-11 which implemented those calls, is simply irrational. And worse, Islamophobia is a response to those attacks that reflects a bigotry that itself should be feared. That's the idea. Islam, however, is different from Christianity, Hinduism, Judaism, and most other faiths in that it is a political religion. Muslims recognize no separation between religion and state, and in the canonical texts and teachings of Islam, Islam regards all other religions and non-religions as infidel creeds. Moreover, Islam aspires to establish a global Islamic state, a caliphate, that would impose Islamic law on individuals everywhere and criminalize heretical thoughts. And that's where Islamophobia comes in. Abdurrahman Muhammad is a former member of the International Institute of Islamic Thought. He was present when the word Islamophobia was created, but he now characterizes the whole concept of Islamophobia this way. He says, this loathsome term is nothing more than a thought-terminating cliché conceived in the bowels of Muslim think tanks for the purpose of beating down critics. In short, in its very origins, Islamophobia was a term designed as a weapon to stigmatize and silence anyone who opposed jihad terror. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or OIC, which is 56 Muslim governments worldwide and the Palestinian Authority, began a campaign against Islamophobia in 2008. The OIC declared its intention to craft a legal instrument to fight against the threat to Islam from what they said were political cartoonists and bigots. Of course, they were referring to the Danish cartoons of Muhammad that appeared in 2005, touching off international riots and killings by Muslims worldwide, the burning of embassies, the murder of non-Muslims, including a Catholic nun. Ekmel Adin Isanolu, the Secretary General of the OIC at that time, said Muslims are being targeted by a campaign of defamation, denigration, stereotyping, intolerance, and discrimination. Note that he was talking about the cartoons of Muhammad, not the people who were killed over the cartoons of Muhammad. Isanolu went on to say, Islamophobia cannot be dealt with only through cultural activities, but through a robust political engagement. That engagement would be directed toward restricting the freedom of speech. Abdullaye Wade, president of Senegal at that time and the OIC chairman, explained it this way. He said, I don't think freedom of expression should mean freedom from blasphemy. There can be no freedom without limits. In July 2008, in a briefing on Capitol Hill, Pakistani embassy representative Asma Fatima defended the Muslim outrage as necessary and called for restrictions on speech that insulted Islam. She said, the ideal of freedom of speech is precious to you, but it's not value neutral. You don't have to hurt people's sentiments and bring them to the point where they have to react in strange ways. This is the ultimate goal of charges of Islamophobia, to stigmatize, demonize, marginalize, and ultimately criminalize criticism of Islam, such that jihad terror activities can continue unimpeded and unopposed. The charge of Islamophobia is a valuable tool the allies and supporters of jihad terrorists have to silence the foes of jihad terror. For more information, go to this website. Everyone says Islam is a religion of peace, all authorities in the Western world. And yet, all over the world, we see Muslims committing violence and justifying it by reference to Islamic texts. How are we to understand this? In the first place, we have to distinguish between Islam and Muslims. There's a great deal of confusion on this point. People think that because they know a Muslim who's a nice guy, that Islam must teach peace. In fact, the teachings of any particular religion are one thing, and the way each individual puts those teachings into practice is quite another. 
there's a spectrum of belief, knowledge, and fervor among the adherents of all religions. Some are very devout and knowledgeable about their religion's teachings. Others are devout, but less knowledgeable. Others are knowledgeable, but not devout, and so on. So one cannot assume that just because a particular Muslim is a good person, that Islam does not teach warfare against and subjugation of unbelievers. Unfortunately, it does. Islamic jihadis are very clear about this, always grounding their actions in the Quran, the holy book of Islam, and the example of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. Abdullah Azam, the co-founder of Al-Qaeda, explained that Muhammad, he said, was a master of the Mujahideen, the warriors of jihad, and a model for fortunate, inexperienced people. The total number of military excursions which he accompanied was 27. He himself fought in nine of these, and then Azam named some of the major battles in Islamic history, Badr, Uhud, Amaraisi, the Trench, Koraiza, Kaibar, the conquest of Mecca, Hunayn, and Taif. He said Muhammad was on all of these expeditions. And he said, this means that the messenger of Allah used to go out on military expeditions or send out an army at least every two months. And the Egyptian Islamic scholar Nasser Hamid Abu Zaid said, if we follow the rules of interpretation developed from the classical science of Quranic interpretation, it is not possible to condemn terrorism in religious terms. It remains completely true to the classical rules in its evolution of sanctity for its own justification. This is where the secret, he said, of its theological strength lies. One finds the same thing when one turns to the authoritative sources in Sunni Islam, the schools of Sunni jurisprudence, or Madhadhib, the Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, and Hanbali. These are not brick and mortar schools, but schools of thought, schools of law, with each prevailing in various regions of the Islamic world and most Muslims adhering to one or the other. A manual of Islamic law of the Shafi'i school was certified in 1991 by the clerics at Al-Azhar University, one of the leading authorities in the Islamic world, and where Barack Obama spoke in 2009, they certified this book as a reliable guide to Sunni orthodoxy, and Sunnis are 85 to 90 percent of Muslims worldwide. This manual of Islamic law stipulates about jihad that the caliph makes war upon Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians until they become Muslim or pay the non-Muslim poll tax. It adds a comment by Sheikh Nuh Ali Salman, a Jordanian expert on Islamic jurisprudence. The caliph wages this war only provided that he has first invited Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians to enter Islam in faith and practice. And if they will not, then invited them to enter the social order of Islam by paying the non-Muslim poll tax, jizya, which is specified in the Quran and is a sign of the subjugation of the non-believers while remaining in their ancestral religions. Without a caliphate, only defensive jihad is allowed. The goal of defensive jihad, however, is not peaceful coexistence with non-Muslims as equals. This same manual of Islamic law specifies that the warfare against non-Muslims must continue until the final descent of Jesus. That's Jesus the Muslim prophet, not Jesus the Savior. After that, nothing but Islam will be accepted from them, for taking the poll tax is only effective until Jesus' descent. That is. Until Jesus, the Muslim prophet, returns, the Christians may live subjugated under the rule of Islamic law, but when he returns, it's convert to Islam or die. That warfare against unbelievers is being pursued all over the world today. Many people claim Muhammad was a prophet of peace who taught peace. The best way to determine whether or not that is true is to look at what Muhammad himself said. In hadiths or reports about his words and deeds that Muslims consider reliable. Muhammad said, I have been commanded to fight against people until they testify that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. There is a threat attached in another version of that hadith which has Muhammad saying, I have been ordered to fight the people till they say none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. And if they say so, Pray like our prayers, face our Qibla, that is the direction for prayer, and slaughter as we slaughter. Then their blood and property will be sacred to us, and we will not interfere with them except legally. Their blood and property will be sacred to us, that is, left undisturbed, instead of being killed and their property seized. Muhammad said, striving in the path of Allah, that is jihad, is incumbent on you, along with every ruler, whether he is pious or impious. He also said, know that paradise is under the shades of swords. Muhammad said, fight in the name of Allah and in the way of Allah. 
fight against those who disbelieve in Allah, make a holy war. When you meet your enemies who are polytheists, invite them to three courses of action. If they respond to any one of these, you also accept it and withhold yourself from doing them any harm. Invite them to accept Islam. If they respond to you, accept it from them and desist from fighting against them. If they refuse to accept Islam, demand from them the jizya. If they agree to pay, accept it from them and hold off your hands. If they refuse to pay the tax, seek Allah's help and fight them. Muhammad said, the hour will not be established until you fight with the Jews, and the stone behind which a Jew will be hiding will say, O oh Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. Muhammad said, He who fights that Allah's word, Islam, should be superior, fights in Allah's cause. He said, The person who participates in holy battles in Allah's cause, and nothing compels him to do so except belief in Allah and his apostle, will be recompensed by Allah either with a reward or booty if he survives, or will be admitted to paradise if he is killed. Muhammad said, I have been made victorious with terror. Muhammad was asked whether it was permissible to attack enemy forces at night if it would endanger their women and children. He replied, they are from them. That is, the women and children are of the enemy, so it's permissible to kill them. Muhammad said, three things are the roots of faith. To refrain from killing a person who utters, there is no God but Allah, and not to declare him unbeliever, whatever sin he commits, and not to excommunicate him from Islam for any of his actions. And jihad will be performed continuously since the day Allah sent me as a prophet until the day the last member of my community will fight with the Dajjal, that is the Islamic idea of the Antichrist. Muhammad said, I decided to order a man to lead the prayer and then take a flame to burn all those who had not left their houses for the prayer, burning them alive inside their homes. Muhammad said, kill any Jew who falls under your power. Muhammad also said, killing unbelievers is a small matter to us. Now remember, Muhammad is the excellent example for Muslims to imitate according to the Quran. And we see in all the violence Muslims are today perpetrating worldwide, that indeed very many Muslims are imitating Muhammad. For more information about this, see this website. Many passages in the Quran directly and indirectly exhort Muslims to commit acts of violence. The Quran says, and slay them wherever you find them and expel them from where they expelled you. Persecution is more grievous than slaughter, but fight them not by the holy mosque until they should fight you there. And then if they fight you, slay them. Such is the recompense of unbelievers. But if they give over, surely Allah is all forgiving, all compassionate. Fight them till there is no persecution and the religion is Allah's. Then if they give over, there shall be no enmity save for evildoers. The Quran also mandates the killing of those who become Muslims, but then leave the faith. The Quran says, they wish that you should disbelieve as they disbelieve, and then you would be equal. Therefore, take not to yourselves friends of them until they emigrate in the way of Allah, that is, until they join the Muslims. Then, if they turn their backs, take them and slay them wherever you find them. Take not to yourselves any one of them as friend or helper. The fighting that the Quran commands must continue until the entire world is under the rule of Islam. The Quran says, fight them till there is no persecution and the religion is Allah's entirely. Then if they give over, surely Allah sees the things they do. The Quran even tells Muslims to strike terror into the hearts of the enemies of Allah. Make ready for them, it says, whatever force and strings of horses you can to strike terror into the hearts of the enemy of Allah and your enemy and others besides them that you don't know, Allah knows them. And whatever you expend in the way of Allah shall be repaid you in full. You will not be wronged. Three times in the Quran, Allah tells believers to kill them wherever you find them. The most famous of these is the verse of the sword, for which Osama bin Laden praised Allah in one of his communiques. It goes like this. Then when the sacred months are drawn away, slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them and confine them, and lie in wait for them at every place of ambush. But if they repent and perform the prayer and pay the alms, then let them go their way. Allah is all forgiving, all compassionate. Repent, pay the alms, all that means, in other words, if they convert to Islam, don't kill them. 
The Quran also commands Muslims to fight against the people of the book, that is primarily Jews and Christians, and subjugate them under the rule of Islamic law. It says, fight those who do not believe in Allah in the last day, and do not forbid what Allah and his messenger have forbidden. Such men as practice not the religion of truth, that is, of course, Islam, being of those who have been given the book, that is, the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. The Quran also provides a justification for suicide bombing when it promises paradise to those who kill and are killed. It says, Allah has bought from the believers their lives and their possessions, and for them is the gift of paradise. They fight in the way of Allah, they kill and are killed. Finally, the Quran tells Muslims to behead unbelievers and make a wide slaughter among them. It says, when you meet the unbelievers, strike their necks. Then, when you have made wide slaughter among them, tie fast the bonds. Then set them free, either by grace or ransom, until the war lays down its loads. So that's three verses about slaying polytheists and apostates and idolaters wherever they are found, one about beating disobedient women, two about beheading, to mandating amputation as punishment, all this is in the Quran and more. However, Muslim spokesmen in the West explain these away as applying only to the seventh century or under strict circumstances, etc., etc. The problem is, with so many jihad terror groups around the world and with Sharia regimes being so oppressive, it's hard to see how all this can be reconciled with the claim that Islam is a religion of peace. For more information about this, see this website. Many people assume there are many peaceful verses in the Quran, and indeed there are several peaceful verses in the Quran. One notable passage in joining tolerance is Surah 109, which says in its entirety, Say, O disbelievers, I do not worship what you worship, nor do you worship what I worship, and I shall not worship what you worship, nor will you worship what I worship. To you is your religion, and to me is my religion. Other verses add to this seeming indifference the contention that Allah will ultimately judge the unbelievers and cast them into hell. Thus, Allah tells Muhammad not to waste his time arguing with those who reject his message, but to leave them in peace until that terrible day. So the Quran says, so leave them alone until they encounter that day of theirs on which they will swoon. Above all, no Muslim should forcibly convert an unbeliever. And the famous passage of the Quran says, let there be no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Whoever rejects evil and believes in Allah has grasped the most trustworthy handhold that never breaks, and Allah hears and knows all things. Following this celebrated verse comes another threat of hell. Quran says, Allah is the protector of those who have faith. From the depths of darkness, he will lead them forth into light. Of those who reject faith, the patrons are the evil ones. From light, they will lead them forth into depths of darkness. They will be companions of the fire to dwell therein. Since Jews and Christians, called the people of the book in the Quran, will face exactly that dreadful judgment, Allah admonishes his prophet not to argue with them. Instead, he is to emphasize that he believes in the same God they do. And so the Quran says, do not dispute with the people of the book, except with better means, unless it be with those of them who inflict wrong. But say, we believe in the revelation which has come down to us, and in that which has come down to you. Our Allah and your Allah is one, and it is to him we bow. And then, of course, there's one of the most often quoted verses of the Quran, which goes like this. Because of that, we decreed upon the children of Israel that whoever kills a soul, unless for a soul or for corruption in the land, it is as if he had slain mankind entirely. And whoever saves one, it is as if he had saved mankind entirely. And our messengers had certainly come to them with clear proofs. Then indeed many of them after that throughout the land were transgressors. Now there's less to this than Western leaders and Islamic apologists claim. First, it's not a general prohibition of killing. There are big exceptions for those who kill for a soul or for corruption in the land. Second, this is not a general command, but one only for the children of Israel. Third, many of them after that were transgressors, it says. So all that it's really saying is that Allah gave a command to the children of Israel and they transgressed against it. Nor do most of the people who mention that verse mention that it's followed by verse 533, which specifies the punishment for the corruption and transgressions of the children of Israel. That verse goes like this. Indeed, the penalty for those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive upon the earth corruption 
is none that they be killed or crucified or that their hands and feet be cut off from opposite sides or that they be exiled from the land. That is for them a disgrace in this world and for them in the hereafter a great punishment. But what about the other passages enjoining tolerance and patience with unbelievers? Many traditional Islamic theologians and Quran commentators actually argue that violent material, such as the verse of the sword, which is the celebrated command to slay the idolaters wherever you find them, actually abrogates more relatively tolerant material. Now this means that whatever the Quran teaches about peace with unbelievers is superseded and overridden by passages enjoining violence. And that doctrine of abrogation is also based on the Quran itself. For more information about this, go to this website. Many people say ISIS is not Islamic because they have killed more Muslims than non-Muslims. ISIS has been criticized for killing Muslims as well as non-Muslims because this is an apparent defiance of the Quran's injunction. Never is it for a believer to kill a believer except by mistake. So in their own defense, partisans of the Islamic State have argued not on prudential, but on Islamic theological grounds, making copious reference to Islamic sources. They've portrayed the murderous behavior of the Islamic State as legitimate jihad, operations that every Muslim should endorse. Responding to similar criticism 10 years ago, Iraqi jihad leader Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the leader of the Al-Qaeda group that ultimately became ISIS, insisted that his group was behaving in a strictly Islamic manner. He took for granted that Muslims had a responsibility before Allah to wage war against unbelievers. Zarqawi said, there's no doubt that Allah commanded us to strike the kuffar, that is unbelievers, kill them, and fight them by all means necessary to achieve the goal. He emphasized that any means at all were permissible in this endeavor. He said, the servants of Allah who perform jihad to elevate the word of Allah are permitted to use any and all means necessary to strike the active unbeliever combatants for the purpose of killing them, snatch their souls from their body, cleanse the earth from their abomination, and lift their trial and persecution of the servants of Allah. This goal must be pursued even if the means to accomplish it affect both the intended active fighters and unintended passive ones, such as women, children, or any other passive category specified by our jurisprudence. Az-Zarqawi was arguing, in other words, that operations such as 9-11 were fully sanctioned by Islamic law even if women and children were killed in them. And that remained true, he argued, even if Muslims were killed as collateral damage. He said, this permissibility extends to situations in which Muslims may get killed if they happen to be with or near the intended enemy, and if it is not possible to avoid hitting them or separate them from the intended kafirs. Although spilling sacred Muslim blood is a grave offense, it is not only permissible, but it is mandated in order to prevent more serious adversity from happening, stalling, or abandoning jihad that is. Now, Zarqawi was killed over two years before Barack Obama became president, and eight years before Obama said ISIL, as he calls the Islamic State, is not Islamic. Obama said no religion condones the killing of innocents, and the vast majority of ISIL's victims have been Muslim. Obama was assuming that because its victims were Muslim, the Islamic State must not be Islamic. However, ISIS's foremost founding figure had long before that explained why this was a false assumption. Moreover, as far as Zarqabi was concerned, those who denied that it was permissible to kill Muslims in jihad operations were enabling the victory of the infidels over the Muslims and the consequent disunity and subjugation of the worldwide Muslim community. He said, if one says that we must not allow the killing of Muslims under any circumstance, especially in light of modern war tactics, this means nothing except stalling or permanently abandoning jihad. This will lead to handing over the land and people to the unbelievers who are full of hate for Islam and Muslims. The unbelievers will have a free hand to humiliate and persecute Islam and Muslims, and Muslims will be forced to live by kafir rules and be treated like slaves. Many Muslims will be pressured or forced to give up their religion. Islam will be altered, modified, and replaced with another form that will be totally different from that which was revealed to the one who was sent with the sword, peace and prayer be upon him. Of course, he's referring to Muhammad. The principles Zarqawi delineated would become the hallmarks of the Islamic State. That any means were acceptable in fighting against and killing non-Muslims 
which was an Islamic responsibility, and that it was acceptable to kill fellow Muslims in service of the goal of implementing Islamic law over the entire world. The Islamic State, or ISIS, doesn't represent 1.5 billion Muslims. Many Muslims have repudiated it. However, 30,000 Muslims from all over the world have joined it because it presents itself as the truest embodiment of Islam. And those who repudiate it have not been able to counter its appeal. The Islamic State is self-consciously Islamic. In June 2014, a video circulated of a masked Islamic State commander telling a cheering crowd, by Allah, we embarked on our jihad only to support the religion of Allah. Allah willing, we will establish a state ruled by the Quran and the Sunnah. All of you honorable Muslims are the soldiers of the Muslim state. He promised that the Islamic state would establish the Sharia of Allah, the Quran, and the Sunnah, as the crowd repeatedly responded with cries of Allahu Akbar. The Islamic state's very public beheadings have horrified the world. In large part, they were responsible for the wave of public concern about ISIS in America that led to the initiation of U.S.-led airstrikes against the Islamic State. Many have taken them, the beheadings that is, as a sign for, the, for all its vaunted media savvy, the Islamic State will ultimately be undone by its own savagery, as the world will ultimately have had enough of this horror and will move to destroy ISIS once and for all. Why then does the Islamic State behead anyone? much less film the beheadings and post them on social media. Because, from their standpoint, beheadings are a recruitment tool, one that's rooted in the Quran. The Muslim holy book says very straightforwardly, when you meet the unbelievers, strike the necks. The Islamic State knows the young Muslims who are aware of that verse will not recoil in horror and disgust from their beheading videos, but rather they will realize that the Islamic State is acting in fidelity with the Quran. Thus, the beheadings will bolster the Islamic State's claim to constitute the new caliphate. The beheading videos also strike terror into the hearts of the enemies of Allah, which is another quote from the Quran. Thus, as far as the jihadis of the Islamic State are concerned, the world's revulsion and disgust at their beheading videos are only confirmation that they are on the right track. On December 15, 2014, the Islamic State released a document entitled Clarification Regarding the Hudud, that is, punishments Allah specifies in the Quran. This was essentially the Islamic State's penal code, and every aspect of it was drawn from Islamic teaching. The clarification mandates death for blasphemy against Allah or Muhammad. It specifies that murder with stealing will be punished by death and crucifixion of the dead body. Murder alone will be punishable by just simply death. Stealing, as part of banditry, will be rewarded with the amputation of the right hand and the left leg, and terrorizing people will result in exile. All these penalties and more are derived from this particular Quranic verse. Indeed, the penalty for those who wage war against Allah and His Messenger, and strive upon the earth corruption, is none but they be killed or crucified, or that their hands and feet be cut off from opposite sides, or that they be exiled from the land. That is for them a disgrace in this world, and for them in the hereafter is a great punishment, except for those who return before you apprehend them and know that Allah is forgiving and merciful. In fact, every last one of the Islamic State's penalties line up with the Quran and Muhammad's words in the Hadith. In so scrupulously carrying out the commands of their faith, the Muslims of the Islamic State have sought to buttress their claim to be the new caliphate. It's the basis of their appeal. Jihad is a central duty of every Muslim. It's Arabic for struggle. Muslim theologians have spoken of many things as jihads. The struggle within the soul, defending the faith from critics, supporting the growth of the faith and its defense financially, and even migrating to non-Muslim lands for the purpose of propagating Islam. But violent jihad is a constant of Islamic history and a central element of Islamic theology. Many passages in the Quran and the sayings of the Islamic prophet Muhammad are used by jihad warriors today to justify their actions and to gain new recruits. No major Muslim group has ever repudiated the doctrines of armed jihad. The theology of jihad, which denies unbelievers equality of rights and dignity, is available today for anyone with the will and the means to bring it to life. In Islamic history and doctrine, violent jihad is founded on numerous verses of the Quran, 
most notably one known in Islamic theology as the verse of the sword, goes this way. Then when the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever you find them. Take them captive and besiege them and prepare for them every ambush. But if they repent and establish worship and pay the poor due, then leave their way free. Lo, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Establishing regular worship and paying the poor due, or zakat, means essentially that they will become Muslim, as these are two of the central responsibilities of every Muslim. The authoritative sources in Sunni Islam, the schools of Sunni jurisprudence, or madhadib, make clear what jihad is. A Shafi'i manual of Islamic law that was certified in 1991 by the clerics at Al-Azhar University, one of the leading authorities in the Islamic world as a reliable guide to Sunni orthodoxy, stipulates about jihad that the caliph makes war upon Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians until they become Muslim or pay the non-Muslim poll tax. A Hanafi manual of Islamic law repeats the same injunctions. It insists that people must be called to embrace Islam before being fought because the prophet so instructed his commanders, directing them to call the infidels to the faith. However, it goes on to say, if the infidels, upon receiving the call, neither consent to it nor agree to pay capitation tax, that is the jizya, it is then incumbent upon the Muslims to call upon Allah for assistance and to make war upon them, because Allah is the assistant of those who serve him and the destroyer of his enemies, the infidels, and it is necessary to implore his aid upon every occasion. The Prophet, moreover, commands us so to do. Ibn Khaldun, a pioneering historian and philosopher, was also a Maliki legal theorist. In his renowned Muqaddimah, the first work of historical theory, he notes that in the Muslim community, the holy war is a religious duty. Because of the universalism of the Muslim mission and the obligation to convert everybody to Islam, either by persuasion or by force. In Islam, the person in charge of religious affairs is concerned with power politics because Islam, he said, is under obligation to gain power over the nations. The great medieval theorist of what is commonly known today as radical or fundamentalist Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, was a Hanbali jurist. He directed that since lawful warfare is essentially jihad, and since its aim is that the religion is Allah's entirely and Allah's word is uppermost, therefore, according to all Muslims, those who stand in the way of this aim must be fought. Violent jihad is a constant of Islamic history. No major Muslim group has ever repudiated the doctrines of armed jihad. The theology of jihad with all its assumptions about unbelievers and their lack of human rights and dignity is available today as a justification for anyone with the will and the means to bring it to life. A true Islamic country will scrupulously follow the directives of the Quran. In the Quran, Allah mandates that the Muslims fight against the Jews and the Christians until they pay the jizya, which is a poll tax, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. The Muslims, of course, are exempt from paying this tax. This verse is the one place where Allah directs Muslims explicitly to make war against and subjugate Jews and Christians, the people of the book who, once subjugated, enter the dimma, the protection of the Muslims, and become dimmis, or protected people. The Islamic scholar Ibn Juzay says that this verse is a command to fight the people of the book. Muslims must fight them because they consider as lawful carrion, blood, pork, and so on, and because, he says, they do not enter Islam. He says that scholars agree about accepting jizya from the Jews and Christians and adds that the Magians, or Zoroastrians, have been added to them going by the words of the prophet, treat them as people of the book, although there is disagreement about accepting it from idolaters and Sabians, which means that people who are considered polytheists, they have to convert or die, there is no intermediate stage of so-called protection. He specifies that the tax is not collected from women, children, or the insane and that it signifies submission and obedience. Another Islamic scholar, Asawi, specifies that the payment of the jizya signifies that the non-Muslims are humble and obedient to the judgments of Islam. Asuyudi, another Islamic scholar, notes that the jizya is not taken from someone in a state of hardship, although that was a stipulation at times honored in the breach. For example, a contemporary account of the Muslims' conquest of Nikiu which was an Egyptian town in the 640s, says that it is impossible to describe 
the lamentable position of the inhabitants of this town, who came to the point of offering their children in exchange for the enormous sums that they had to pay each month. Similarly, Ibn Kathir says that the Dimmis must be disgraced, humiliated, and belittled. Therefore, Muslims are not allowed to honor the people of Dimma or elevate them above Muslims, for they are miserable, disgraced, and humiliated. The seventh century jurist Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib said, I prefer that the people of the Dimma become tired by paying the jizya, since he, that is Allah, says, until they pay the jizya with their own hands in a state of complete abasement, from the Quran. Another Islamic scholar, as Suyuti, elaborates that this verse is used as a proof by those who say that it is taken in a humiliating way. And so the taker sits and the dimmi stands with his head bowed and his back bent. The jizya is placed in the balance and the taker seizes his beard and hits his chin. He adds, however, that this is rejected according to An-Nawawi, who said this manner is un invalid. However, still another Islamic scholar, Zamakshari, agreed that the jizya should be collected with belittlement and humiliation of the non-Muslims. The imperative to subjugate non-Muslims as mandated by the Quran and elaborated by the Pact of Umar remains part of Islamic law to this day. The Pakistani jihadist writer and activist Sayyid Abu Allah Maududi, a 20th century figure, states that the simple fact is that according to Islam, non-Muslims have been granted the freedom to stay outside the Islamic fold and to cling to their false man-made ways if they so wish. That heads off any potential contradiction between his understanding of two verses of the Quran, the one that says that the non-Muslims must pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued, and the other saying there is no compulsion in religion. Maududi continues by declaring that the unbelievers have absolutely no right to seize the reins of power in any part of Allah's earth, nor to direct the collective affairs of human beings according to their own misconceived doctrines. For if they are given such an opportunity, corruption and mischief will ensue. In such a situation, he says, the believers would be under an obligation to do their utmost to dislodge them from political power and to make them live in subservience to the Islamic way of life. On the basis of such teachings, the Islamic State demanded the jizya from the Christians of Mosul in Iraq when it took the city in 2014 and it has now begun to collect it also from the Christians under its rule in Syria. And this remains part of Islamic law to this day. For more information about this, go to this website. In explaining how the Jews and Christians must feel themselves subdued in accord with the Quran's commands, the great Islamic scholar Ibn Kathir quotes a saying of Muhammad, do not initiate the salam, the greeting of peace, to the Jews and Christians, and if you meet any of them in a road, force them to the narrowest alley. Ibn Kathir then goes on to outline the notorious, and almost certainly legendary, Pact of Umar, which was an agreement made according to Islamic tradition between the Caliph Umar, who ruled the Muslims from 634 to 644 AD, and a Christian community. This pact is worth close examination because despite its very slight historical value, it reflects the basis, the foundation of Islamic law regarding the treatment of the Zummis, Dimmis, that is, the subjugated people under Islamic law. With remarkably little variation throughout Islamic history, wherever and whenever Islamic law has been strictly enforced, this is generally how non-Muslims have been treated. Working from the full text, as Ibn Kathir has it, here are the conditions the Christians accept in return for what it terms safety for ourselves, children, property, and followers of our religion. Conditions that, according to Ibn Kathir, ensured their continued humiliation, degradation, and disgrace in accord with the Quran's command. The Christians agree they will, will not build a monastery, church, or a sanctuary for a monk. They will not restore any place of worship that needs restoration. They will not use such places for the purpose of enmity against Muslims. They will not allow a spy against Muslims into their churches and homes or hide deceit or betrayal against the Muslims. They will not imitate the Muslims' clothing, caps, turbans, sandals, hairstyles, speech, nicknames, and title names. They will not ride on saddles. They will not hang swords on their shoulders. They will not collect weapons of any kind or carry those weapons. They will not encrypt their stamps in Arabic. 
They will not sell liquor. You may recall Christians in Iraq over the last few years ran afoul of Muslims violently reasserting that rule. They will not teach their children the Quran. They will not publicize practices of shirk, that is, associating partners with Allah in worship, that is, regarding Jesus as the Son of God. In other words, Christians and other non-Muslim, all of their religious practice must be private, if not furtive. Christians agreed not to build crosses on the outside of their churches, demonstrating them, putting their books in public or in Muslim fairways and markets. Again, Christian worship must not be public, where Muslims can see it and become annoyed. Christians agreed not to sound bells in churches except discreetly or raise their voices while reciting their holy books inside their churches in the presence of Muslims, nor raise their voices at funerals or light torches at funeral processions in the fairways of Muslims or their markets. They will not bury their dead next to Muslim dead. That would be unclean. They will not buy servants who are captured by Muslims or invite anyone to shirk. That is, they're not going to bring the gospel to anybody new. Although the Christians also agree not to prevent any of their fellows from embracing Islam if they chose to do so. So the Christians can be the object of proselytizing but must not engage in it themselves. And of course, they must not beat any Muslim. Meanwhile, the Christians will allow Muslims to rest in their churches, whether they come by day or night, open the doors of their houses of worship for the wayfarer and passerby, provide board and food for those Muslims who come as guests for three days, respect Muslims, move from the places they sit in, if they choose to sit in them, like shades of the old Jim Crow South, have the front of their hair cut where their customary clothes, wherever they are, wear belts around their waist. These rules are so that a Muslim can recognize that a non-Muslim is coming and doesn't make the mistake of greeting him with assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, which is the Muslim greeting reserved only for a fellow Muslim. The Christians also agree to be guides for Muslims and refrain from breaching their privacy in their homes. So Muslims can come to a Christian home and demand to be put up there for three days, but the Christians, of course, don't dare to go to Muslims' homes. The Christians swore, if we break any of these promises that we set for your benefit against ourselves, then our zumma or dimma, promise of protection, is broken, and you are allowed to do with us what you are allowed to do to people of defiance and rebellion, that is, kill them. These are still the parameters of Islamic law regarding non-Muslims to this day. For more information, go to this website. Sharia is Islamic law. It's derived from the Quran and the Sunnah, that is the way of Muhammad, as derived from the Hadith, the reports on his words and deeds, and the Sirah, his biography. It's based on the Quran's numerous commands to obey Allah and obey the messenger, that is, Muhammad. Sharia governs every aspect of life. It contains rules for every conceivable human behavior. It centers on Muhammad's example as the perfect example of conduct for Muslims and the model for emulation in all circumstances. It contains rules for the governing of the state as well as of individual behavior. And with its denial of the freedom of speech and the equality of rights for women and non-Muslims, it is absolutely incompatible with the principles and freedoms of the U.S. Constitution. Muslims are commanded to try to extend the rule of Sharia over all lands, Muslim and non-Muslim. Because it is considered to be the perfect law of Allah, Sharia is not susceptible to reform or revision. Most majority Muslim countries today do not fully implement Sharia, which causes some people to mistakenly believe that there are moderate versions of Sharia that don't call for stoning, amputation, beheading, and the like. But in reality, every form of Sharia mandates such punishments, but not all Muslim countries implement them. Now, despite all this, Muslims maintain that Sharia is the supreme manifestation of justice and results in a just society when it is implemented. This is because words often don't mean the same things to Muslims that they do to Westerners. Justice in the Quran does not mean equal treatment for all people. The Quran and Islam in general doesn't teach that all people are equal in dignity. On the contrary, while it tells Muslims that they are the best nation produced as an example for mankind, it says of they who disbelieved among the people of the scripture and the polytheists that they are the worst, the most vile of created beings. The Quran directs Muslims not to treat each group equally, but rather to be forceful against the disbelievers while being merciful among themselves, that is, among fellow Muslims. In line with this, the Islamic law of retaliation, or kisas, for murder establishes as a point of law 
that the life of a non-Muslim does not have the same value as that of a Muslim, and that a woman's life is not as valuable as a man's. A Sharia manual certified by the most respected authority in Sunni Islam, Al-Azhar University in Cairo, as conforming to the practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community, stipulates that a payment can be made for taking a woman's life, but it's only half of that to be paid for taking a man's life, and that there's also a sliding scale based on religious belief. If somebody kills a Jew or a Christian, one need pay only one-third of that which must be paid for killing an adult male Muslim. Now, these are universal Islamic principles. An Iranian Sufi Muslim cleric, Sheikh Sultan Hussein Tabande, who was instrumental in formulating the legal code for the Islamic Republic of Iran after the Islamic Revolution of 1979, justified exactly this kind of inequality in his commentary on the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. He said this, if a Muslim deliberately murders another Muslim, he falls under the law of retaliation and must by law be put to death by the next of kin. But if a non-Muslim who dies at the hand of a Muslim has by lifelong habit been a non-Muslim, the penalty of death is not valid. Instead, the Muslim murderer must pay a fine and be punished with the lash. Now, why is that? He explains, because Islam regards non-Muslims as on a lower level of belief and conviction. Therefore, he says, if a Muslim kills a non-Muslim, then his punishment must not be the retaliatory death, since the faith and conviction he possesses is loftier than that of the man slain. Tabanda concludes, Islam and its peoples must be above the infidels and never permit non-Muslims to acquire lordship over them. That institutionalized inequality and the devaluation of non-Muslim lives is the hallmark of Sharia. For more information on this, go to this website. Hudud punishments in Islamic law are those that are considered to be fixed by Allah Himself in the Quran and Sunnah. As such, they cannot be relaxed or mitigated without, in the eyes of many, sinning against Allah. Most who did punishments are specified in the Quran itself. For example, amputation of the hand for theft. As to the thief, the Quran says, male or female, cut off his or her hands, a punishment by way of example from Allah for their crime, and Allah is exalted in power. Crucifixion is actually specified in the Quran, as well as amputation or exile for those who are considered to be waging war against Allah and Muhammad. Now you think about that, that's a very elastic concept waging war against Allah and Muhammad. The punishment, it says, of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive with might and main for mischief through the land is execution or crucifixion or the cutting off of hands and feet from opposite sides or exile from the land. That is their disgrace in this world and a heavy punishment is theirs in the hereafter. Lashing for illicit sex is also set out in the Quran the Quran says the man and the woman guilty of adultery or fornication flog each of them with a hundred stripes. Let not compassion move you in their case in a matter prescribed by Allah if you believe in Allah and the last day and let a party of the believers witness their punishment. Now let not compassion move you in their case is already departing from any idea of God as genuinely merciful and compassionate but it gets even worse in a hadith where the Caliph Umar, one of Muhammad's closest companions, said that the penalty for adultery was not lashing at all, but was actually stoning to death, and even maintained that that was what was originally in the Quran, although he doesn't explain how it dropped out. According to a hadith, Umar said, I am afraid that after a long time has passed, people may say, we do not find the verses of the Rajam stoning to death in the holy book, and consequently, they may go astray by leaving an obligation that Allah has revealed. And so Umar adds, Lo, I confirm that the penalty of Rajam be inflicted on him who commits illegal sexual intercourse if he is already married and the crime is proved by witnesses or pregnancy or confession. The Hadith goes on to say that another one of Muhammad's followers, Sufyan, added, I have memorized this narration in this way. In other words, it's another authoritative witness. Umar added, Surely Allah's apostle carried out the penalty of Rajam, and so did we after him. Because, of course, in Islam, Muhammad is the excellent example of conduct. The crime of false accusation of adultery or rape is also to be punished with 80 lashes, as per the Quran. And those who accuse chaste women and then do not produce four witnesses, lash them with 80 lashes, 
and do not accept from them testimony ever after, and those are the defiantly disobedient. Drinking alcohol is also to be punished with 80 lashes. That comes from a Hadith. Anas ibn Malik reported that a person who had drunk wine was brought to Allah's apostle, that is Muhammad. He gave him 40 stripes with two lashes. Abu Bakr also did that, but when Umar assumed the responsibilities of the caliphate, he consulted people and Abd al-Rahman, another follower of Muhammad, said, the mildest punishment for drinking is 80 lashes, and Umar thus prescribed this punishment. Another hadith has Muhammad himself saying, if he's intoxicated, flog him. If he's intoxicated again, flog him again. If he's intoxicated a third time, flog him, and if he does it again a fourth time, kill him. These punishments are not considered to be open to mitigation, as they are commanded by Allah or Muhammad, and the Quran repeatedly tells Muslims to obey Allah and his messenger. And so to this day, wherever Sharia law is fully in force, these punishments are enforced upon the populace, creating an empire of fear, which is what Sharia actually is. Muhammad is depicted in hadiths as saying, I looked into paradise, and I saw that the majority of its people were the poor. And I looked into hell, and I saw that the majority of its people are women. Now, Muhammad was challenged about this. He was asked about it, and he explained, I was shown hell, and I've never seen anything more terrifying than it. And I saw that the majority of its people are women. And they said, why, O oh, Messenger of Allah? He said, because of their ingratitude, and the word used was kufr, the same word that is often translated as unbelief. And it was said, are they ungrateful to Allah? He said, they are ungrateful to their companions, that is, their husbands, and ungrateful for good treatment. If you are kind to one of them for a lifetime, then she sees one undesirable thing in you, she will say, I've never had anything good from you. And in another hadith, Muhammad is depicted, it says, the messenger of Allah went out to the musalla, the place of prayer, on the day of Eid al-Adha or Eid al-Fitr, that is, the two great feasts, the great festivals of the Islamic calendar. He passed by the women and said, O oh, women, give charity, for I have seen that you form the majority of the people of hell. And they asked, Why is that, O messenger of Allah? He replied, You curse frequently and are ungrateful to your husbands. I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligence and religious commitment than you. A cautious, sensible man could be led astray by some of you. The women asked, O oh, messenger of Allah, what is deficient in our intelligence and religious commitment? He said, Is not the testimony of two women equal to the testimony of one man? And they said, Yes, because, of course, that's in the Quran. He said, This is the deficiency in her intelligence. Then he asked, Is it not true that a woman can neither pray nor fast during her menses? And the woman said, Yes. He said, This is the deficiency in her religious commitment. Now, of course, the absurdity of that is clear. He made up those laws, and then he is judging women negatively on the basis of them. Women are essentially slaves of men in Islam. A hadith depicts Muhammad saying, If a husband calls his wife to his bed, that is, to have sexual relations, and she refuses and causes him to sleep in anger, then the angels will curse her till morning. He also said, By him in whose hand lies my life, a woman cannot carry out the right of her Lord till she carries out the right of her husband. And if he asks her to surrender herself, that is, for sexual relations, she should not refuse him even if she is on a camel's saddle. For its part, the Quran likens a woman to a field, tilth, to be used by a man as he wills. It says, your women are a tilth to you to cultivate, so go to your tilth as you will. It declares that a woman's testimony is worth half that of a man, saying, get two witnesses out of your own men, and if there are not two men, then a man and two women, such as you choose for witnesses, so that if one of them errs, the other can remind her. It allows men to marry up to four wives and have sexual relations with slave girls also, saying, if you fear that you shall not be able to deal justly with the orphans, marry women of your choice, two or three or four. But if you fear that you shall not be able to deal justly with them, then marry only one or take a captive that your right hands possess that will be more suitable to prevent you from doing injustice. The captives of the right hand are slave girls specifically for sexual purposes, as the Quran makes clear in several other passages. The Quran also rules that a son's inheritance should be twice the size of that of a daughter, 
saying, Allah directs you as regards your children's inheritance, to the male, a portion equal to that of two females. Worst of all, the Quran tells husbands to beat their disobedient wives. It says, men are in charge of women because Allah has made the one of them to excel the other, that is, men are superior to women. And it goes on to say, because they spend of their property, so good women are obedient, guarding in secret that which Allah has guarded. As for those from whom you fear disobedience, admonish them, banish them to separate beds, and beat them. The Quran also allows for marriage to prepubescent girls, stipulating that Islamic divorce procedures shall apply to those who have not yet menstruated. Clearly, women are second class in Islam, chattels of the men who control them. For more information about this, see this website.